uh, online digital event, which is about uh, food. Um, today we are celebrating the World Food Day. 16th of October has been uh, designated as the World Food Day. And uh, today we have a series of speakers from the Montfort University uh, who have been doing research on food, uh, different dimensions of food. And uh, we want to present to you some of the latest findings of these works. And also to highlight the fact that food has many different dimensions in human lives. Uh, and especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen the importance of food. Uh, as someone who's living in Leicester, I have myself personally witnessed food-related issues during this pandemic. Uh, I recall going to shops, uh, finding, you know, uh, not being able to find foods that I would normally take for granted. Uh, there was panic buying, uh, and some people bought a lot of food, uh, which they did not really need, and there are others uh, who did not have enough money to buy uh, the food that they needed. Or even if they did have money, they could not find uh, the food available in the shops. So I think the importance of food in our lives became really, really uh, vivid and very clear during the pandemic because we really felt insecure. And that's what led us to sort of go and panic buy. Uh, you know, certain foods were not available. Pasta, rice, flour uh, was not available in shops, many shops. Uh, and the fact that we were so vulnerable became also very clear because we depended on shops for all our foods. Uh, nowadays, we live in cities, in urban lifestyle. We don't have really uh, any facilities for growing our own food. And so we really, really needed to sort of like, uh, you know, find a way of surviving under that condition. And despite the government and the authorities and the shops telling us that there was enough food available, the people felt insecure and went on buying uh, more food than they needed. And uh, I'm worried that this situation might emerge again when you have the second wave coming up in, in, in uh, you know, um, coming days, coming weeks. So uh, it really, really shows to us how important food is to human life. And I think COVID-19 has really, really shown the importance of food in human lives, not only in terms of food for our nutrition, but one of the things that has become also evident from the COVID-19 pandemic is the, the idea of food as medicine. A lot of people around the world are choosing foods that will boost their immune system so that they can protect themselves against COVID-19. There are uh, people who are choosing uh, foods because they are led to believe that certain foods can actually cure them of COVID-19. The social media and uh, indeed uh, media in general are full of uh, cures for COVID-19 based around food. Uh, of course, many of these ideas are based on the knowledge that people have regarding food and their value from history, from traditional medicine, and indeed from partial research that scientists have done and that media have to, uh, you know, highlighted that such and such food is good for your health, such and such food is good in killing bacteria, microbes, and so on. So the public have taken a great interest in food as medicine much more than ever before. But at the same time, we have to remember there are people in our society uh, who do not have access to food or do not have access to nutritious food. So there are many issues that affect our society, not only, not only the issue of health in terms of uh, having the right uh, types of food, but even ability to buy food. So at De Montfort University, we have a whole host of researchers working on different aspects of food, from food as medicine to food uh, as a means uh, uh, to improve health, to discussing about food poverty. And today we have a series of lectures from different backgrounds uh, who are going to discuss with us about food and its uh, impact on society with particular focus on COVID-19 and how uh, uh, society as a whole have to work together to ensure that we can all have access to food nutritious food, healthy food, clean food. So today's discussion is going to be around this subject. And we'd like you all to participate in this event. It's an online event. You have a chance to ask questions. There are going to be a question and answer session at the end. There is going to be a panel discussion as well. And you, if you want, you can actually send your comments in. You will find that uh, through the event page on the right-hand side, there is some information regarding sharing uh, your comments and sharing your chat. So please do engage in this event and uh, let us know your thoughts and views uh, regarding the different topics that are going to be covered uh, in the lectures today. So uh, to begin with, today I'm going to be uh, chairing this session. 
Uh, my name is uh, Parvez Harris. I'm the professor of biomedical science in the Leicester School of uh, Allied Health Sciences. And my research uh, has focused on food in relation to health, uh, diet, nutrition, lifestyle. So I will make a presentation at the beginning, and then uh, we'll have a series of lectures by my colleagues uh, who will discuss on other aspects of research that they're doing on food science and, and food. So today's uh, presentations are uh, from a series of experts, and uh, I very much hope that you'll enjoy listening to their lectures. So to begin with now, uh, I will um, start presenting my uh, lecture, which is on food as medicine. So I, I hope you can see the screen. And this is uh, So this is uh, my presentation, which is food as medicine during the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there scientific evidence? So if you think about food as medicine, actually there is no society that, is, uh, that has not used uh, food as medicine. All societies since ancient times have used food as medicine, whether you're talking about the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, the Indians, and Whichever, the, whichever other societies you can think of, whether it is in uh, parts of Africa, whether it is in South America, wherever you are, uh, food is always uh, been something that people have used as a medicine. And for example, there are certain foods such as Nigella sativa or black cumin, which has been found to be used uh, since ancient Greek time. And this is actually proven through ancient, uh, you know, sort of evidences such as they are found uh, the Nigella sativa or black cumin in the, uh, you know, in, in the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamen. And it's been used as a medicine in Egypt and in other societies. And garlic has been used as an ancient medicine for thousands of years. And indeed, even here in the UK, during the Anglo-Saxon period, uh, about thousand years ago, garlic was used as a medicine. And more recently, uh, there is a saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And actually, this originates from Pembrokeshire in Wales around the 1860s. So food as a medicine has been in the midst of society around the world uh, since ancient times. And in the last few decades, actually, as a matter of fact, there has been a massive growth in research exploring the scientific evidence for medicinal benefits of food. And if you open the internet and you search the internet, you'll find a huge number of reports where scientists have actually used a certain food to show its medicinal properties. And here in this slide, what I'm doing is, I'm showing you uh, a, a, a bit of information taken about some research that was done on Nottingham University. And on the, on the left hand side of the slide, you can see uh, something I've taken from the BBC News, which mentions that 1000 year old onion and garlic eye remedy kills MRSA. MRSA is the antibiotic resistant bacteria that there has been a lot of discussion about at some point. Uh, what is that, you know, we don't have antibiotics to kill it. And what this bit of research has shown from Nottingham University is that they've actually managed to uh, use an ancient uh, um, uh, potion, which is based on food, which is based on basically onion and garlic, and they managed to show that it kill, kills uh, kills um, MRSA. And so if you look on, the, on that slide, I have a quote from Nottingham University, uh, who, where the research was done. They say the news of the remarkable success of the experiment has exploded in the public domain, igniting worldwide discussions on whether ancient remedies may be the key to many modern day challenges. So if you look at this, there is a lot of research being done in universities and research institutes showing the merits of uh, ancient, uh, ancient medicines based on food. And this is an Anglo-Saxon example that I've taken. And this research has been replicated at Warwick University and they produced a publication in 2020 proving this uh, to be true. 
and they've actually tried to identify what component of the food might be responsible for it. So when the public gets uh, exposed to such types of research coming from top universities around the world, uh, they of course get interested, attracted because they appear in newspapers, they appear in the internet and so on. And therefore there is a great interest in food as medicine. And indeed a recent survey reported that 80% of consumers have adopted a food as medicine approach to uh, living. So 80% is a large number of consumers. So human beings around the world believe food as medicine, not only because they have uh, learned something from their parents, from their grandparents, or from, from the, their civilization or their culture, but also the fact that scientific research around the world are also showing many, many benefits of traditional remedies uh, based on foods. So this is the slide that want to, I want to show you about food as medicine research that is being conducted at De Montfort University. I will not go into the details, but there are many people uh, in our university who are engaged in research on using food as medicine. And um, not only myself, my colleagues, many of them are engaged in this research. And what we are doing is we are looking at the effects of different foods on uh, antimicrobial properties, how they can kill bacteria and so on, the anti-diabetic properties, anti-cancer properties, antioxidant properties, and so on. And amongst the foods that researchers at the Montford University have been looking at includes garlic, honey, nigella sativa, which is known as uh, uh, black seed often commonly, or black cumin, and elderberries, and you'll have a, a, a lecture from Dr. Harpreet Singh later after me, who will talk about elderberries and uh, his research on this, uh, on this berry, which is, of course, one of those foods which are shown to have many, many beneficial effects on human health. And most of these studies actually have been done in vitro. So that means we've done the studies in test tubes. We have not done them with humans. We have not done randomized clinical trials. However, many of these initial studies on cells and microbes tells us important uh, properties of these uh, uh, food products, whether it is a seed or whether it is a, a fruit or whether it is honey or garlic. And so there are examples of publications we have uh, produced, and uh, there are a few examples there, uh, including the ones uh, that I've been involved with on um, Nigella sativa, and also work that others have done, uh, Shivanti Samarasinghe, who has done work on garlic and honey and her student and so forth. So you can look into this literature uh, there in the internet, and you can find out what we are doing. But essentially, our studies are not on humans, but on cell, cell lines. So, now, what has happened as a consequence of all this interest on food and uh, food-based medicines, there is a lot of facts going around in the internet. And this slide, I don't want to go into the details, but you can see garlic you know, is widely uh, thought to be something that can fight against coronavirus. Lemon is another, turmeric is another food that is being uh, pushed as being something good for um, COVID-19. And then, there, then you have bitter leaf. So there is a lot of media reports that this food is good for COVID-19, that food is go good for COVID-19. But unfortunately, what is lacking is scientific evidence, data to show that they actually do protect you against COVID-19. So there are no randomized clinical trial which have shown that lemon juice or garlic or bitter leaf, which you can see on there, which is chewed in parts of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or garlic, there aren't any real scientific research based on randomized clinical trials showing the proof for these things. And that is why there is concern that, uh, you know, people will be misled into thinking that uh, these um, foods will, uh, you know, actually heal them when in fact they may not. Nevertheless, there are evidences that these foods have some good effects on human health and they could be protective in terms of boosting your immune system, but they may not necessarily cure you of COVID-19. So more research is needed. This is important. More research is needed. And that is why the one positive move that is happening in the UK, at least, is the National Health Service is increasingly supporting a food as medicine approach. So for example, you can have, see on the left-hand side of this slide that thousands of diabetics will be given soup and shake diet plan on the NHS. So there is some of this uh, work being done to actually uh, promote the idea of food as medicine. So uh, there is a lot of discussion about the potential that NHS uh, has in using food as medicine to uh, actually save uh, money and save lives. So there, uh, here what I have is a couple of stories that I would like to give regarding food as medicine, uh, which is being adopted by the NHS. One such um, is the reversal of type 2 diabetes. Now, food 
uh, and uh, certain types of soups and shakes are being given to people so that they can actually uh, you know reverse their diabetes this is the recent information that i've taken from the nhs website so you can see thousands to benefit from soups and shakes diet on the nhs from today also another food that the nhs has actually promoted and approved for use as a medicine is honey honey is uh, being uh, promoted uh, by NHS, NICE, and the Public Health, uh, Public Health uh, England. NICE is the National Institute of, for Clinical Excellence. And what they're doing is that for COVID-19 and for cough in general, they are saying honey and not antibiotics to be used when you have a cough. So for example, if you go into the website of NICE, it actually gives you the dosage, a teaspoon of honey that you can use as a non-drug measure for tackling uh, COVID-19 symptoms. So there is a lot of interest in this and, N and the NHS is increasingly supporting research for food as medicine. So here is an example where they're actually promoting another food for potential use as, uh, instead of using antibiotic, using this particular food for, um, for as, a, as an alternative. So uh, to conclude my presentation, I think an important point to keep in mind is the media is full of information regarding use of food as medicine for COVID-19. And many of these, uh, these uh, ideas that you see in the social media, in Facebook or in Twitter, are actually based on past scientific research on these foods. Maybe not on COVID-19, but actually what people have said, for example, the Anglo-Saxon remedy for, for uh, in, uh, infections and so on. People have seen this in the media and they say, oh, garlic has been useful for antibiotic uh, you know as an antibiotic for fighting infection and they feel you know that can be used for COVID-19 also and the fact that many foods have been traditionally used as medicine through thousands and thousands of years makes a lot of people feel that why not have a go at COVID-19 because there is no medicine for it at the moment so there are there are reasons why people want to use food as medicine because it has been used and it is being used as a medicine, as I gave the example of the NHS use of honey and the NHS use of, for example, other products, uh, including soups and uh, dietary materials. So organizations such as the WHO and other organizations have not refuted the value of food as medicine, but they have raised concerns regarding the lack of scientific evidence for claims of cure. So I think what really is the problem is lack of scientific research, lack of randomized clinical uh, trials and so on. So food as medicine i think no one can refute that idea but the, uh, the the issue is actually getting the evidence so what we need is more funding for scientific research especially randomized clinical trials to prove or disprove the use of foods such as garlic and nigella sativa seeds against covid 19 and other diseases so the big organizations whether it is who or the national health service they're open to the concept of food as medicine as long as it is based on necessary scientific evidence. And the last point that I want to raise before I finish my lecture, this is the last point. Uh, you know, the fact is 80% of consumers have already adopted the concept of food as medicine. So it is out there, the ordinary public, whether in members of my family, my friends, my colleagues, they are using food as medicine. So it's out there. So it's something that is uh, you know, widely accepted and widely used. So what we need to do as scientists and researchers is to need to engage with the public and work with them, to listen to them, share, the, uh, share with them our uh, views regarding what really is scientific evidence and what is not, and actually engage in doing more research to validate all of these ideas that uh, are promoted in the media, whether they're true or not through scientific evidence. So finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So uh, I would like to next uh, ask my colleague, uh, who is from the same school uh, as myself, uh, which is the Leicester School of Allied Hans Health Sciences. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Harpreet Singh, who is uh, an associate professor in the School of Allied Health Sciences. And I would like him to discuss about elderberries, which is one of his research areas. And I'm really, really excited to listen to his uh, uh, latest research on this field. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pavez. That was an excellent talk. And I'm going to continue on the theme on uh, medicine in how it might help uh, to treat uh, COVID or other conditions. Um, so let me just put my PowerPoints on.
I'm hoping that uh, you can see the PowerPoint. So, as Pave said, I'm affiliated with the Nutrition and Metabolic Health theme within the Institute of Allied Health Sciences Research. Uh, my research focuses on the impact of uh, metabolic disease as on cardiovascular function. Uh, in this brief sort of a snapshot, I'm going to show you some uh, data that I've recently been involved with on a project that's looking at the effects of elderberry extracts on cardiovascular function and hopefully hint out the potential benefits this might have um, uh, in patients which are, are of, of COVID-19. Uh, I'd just like to emphasize a point like Pavis made, the, the preliminary data that we are presenting are, are all in vitro work. We, these are cells that we, uh, we use to look at the impact elderberries have had. So um, I do not endorse in any way or another that you go out and buy elderberries and use that as a, as a, as a source of your diet. I will leave that judgment to you decide after the talk. So elderberries. So elderberries uh, um, are rich in a chemical natural compound called anthocyanin. So anthocyanin is a long term molecule called uh, flavonoids, and it's this sort of chemical that gives uh, certain plants their rich red, purple, and blue colouring. Anthocyanins and elderberries have been shown to have several benefits, uh, and there's nice published data that suggests that they have antiviral properties, and it's been shown that they inhibit um, activity of influenza A and, and, and B. It's also been shown to, that elderberries have some anti-cancer, acts as an anti-cancer mediator, and also act as an anti-inflammatory mediator as well. Uh, but the most importantly, and especially uh, in terms of my interests, uh, elderberries have an impact on, in terms of improving cardiovascular function. Okay, so my interests came into elderberries when one of our colleagues uh, who is also leading on this project, Dr. Marisoli de Boit, uh, she's on maternity leave at the moment, uh, uh, and she's a VC 2020 lecturer within our school, uh, who is a nutrition uh, and, and was approached by a company uh, called Iprona, who manufacture food supplements. Uh, they had some uh, elderberry extracts that they wanted us to test out and especially explore their function in terms of how they're molecularly helping improving vascular function. So what we did, we decided to put in a, uh, a DMU full bursary PhD scholarship uh, and uh, successful, uh, we were successful in gaining uh, that scholarship last year. And we appointed uh, Joseph Fester as a PhD student to work on this project. So he started uh, October 2019. So what he did, he started off with performing some simple tests, um, which are indicated in this slide. So I, I don't want to bore you down with the, the molecular detail. Uh, I just want to run you some, some, some key results that he's managed to test. So remember, these um, experiments are done on um, vascular cells. So we use what we call specific endothelial cells. So these endothelial cells um, surround your blood vessels and they act as a barrier. Uh, they maintain vascular tone and they help to maintain vascular integrity. So what did uh, what Joseph did was he took those these elderberry extracts and he treated uh, his endothelial cells with some known concentration of these extracts. Uh, and he performed some simple cell viability assays. So he, he formed this very simple MTT assay, which determined the cell survival uh, capability of that particular cell. Um, and there's some interesting data that he showed. So those cells that, that were treated with 15 milligrams per mil of these elderberry extracts, they significantly improved their survival rate, the viability rate compared to cells that were untreated. Um, and that was quite interesting alone. Um, just, just to discover that that just just by taking these cells, how it improved the survivability rate of that of our vascular cells. Um, he then went on to look at whether that same amount of concentration that improved cell survival, whether that was capable of increasing an enzyme which is ENOS, which is an endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So this enzyme is very important uh, because it's important in converting uh, amino acid called L-arginine to nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a very good mediator. It's, uh, it maintains vascular homeostasis. It also has an anti-inflammatory effect. 
and also is a good vasodilator and it helps to improve uh, blood flow in your blood vessels. And so what he did was he took that concentration of 50 milligrams per mil of elderberry extract. He treated these endothelial cells with the, these elderberries and he then measured the protein levels of uh, that compound ENOS. So what he measured is not only the protein levels, but also he measured the activity levels of this particular enzyme. And very interestingly, uh, over a period of time, uh, it, uh, there was an increase in the activity level of ENOS in these cells treated with uh, this extra, uh, elderberry extracts. Um, and that was quite encouraging. And what that suggests was that there's, due to the increase in ENOS, there would have been an increase in nitric oxide, which might lead to improve in cell integrity. Uh, not only cell survival, but also cell integrity. But you might think, why is this so important in um, uh, the current COVID climate? Well, sorry, so we know that um, the, the COVID is not a condition of the respiratory disease, but also a condition of the cardiovascular disease. And in studies in China that was conducted that patients with raised blood pressure have a twofold increased risk of dying from COVID-19. I'll just put up this slide, uh, just showing you the difference between normal cells and cells infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And I just circulated uh, the, the one sort of area which uh, you can see that there's, there's a decreased levels of nitric oxide in endothelial cells which are transfected with the SARS-CoV-2. But not only that, you can see that the endothelial cells also lose their integrity and become uh, a host of all sorts of media is being expressed, which can cause conditions like um, uh, high inflammatory disease. It disrupts the uh, endothelial barrier and causes endothelial dysfunction. So our data came quite interesting in that we have seen that elderberries are improving the levels of ENOS, uh, a nitric oxide uh, enzyme. So what we want to do is once uh, Joseph returns back into the lab, we want to continue this work and maybe see whether we can improve the function of endothelial cells that have been transfected with the SARS-CoV uh, virus. I know I'm running short of time, so finally I just want to draw your attention to another sort of benefits that may potentially be um, developed in the near future. Um, so a lot is known about how the SARS-CoV-2 virus invades and replicates within the cell. So this is a, a example, a cartoon representation of a cell. And, and there are various anchoring proteins that are ex expressed on the cell surface. And it's well known now, a particular known protein called ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh, protein, is an anchoring protein which can bind to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, allow it to enter the cell. So once the cell enters, once the SARS molecule enters the cell, it is capable of replicating and cause damage to the cell. So these ACE2 proteins are expressed not only on epithelial cells that's lined the lungs, they are expressed on endothelial cells, but also um, there's evidence that they're also expressed in other tissues like your taste buds. And what's been shown recently um, in studies uh, conducted by Fakir et al. is that they've used a, um, a, a virtual screening and computational modeling program, and they managed to screen six anthrocyanin molecules that might potentially bind to the SARS-CoV replication cascade and prevent it from replicating and causing damage. So again, this is still computational models and it'll be quite interesting to see how this research develops and going back to Parvis's point it might be something in the near future that um, uh, anthrocyanin fruits like elderberries or, or other rich sort of source plants which contain this chemical might can be maybe used as a supplement to improve your immune system to improve your defense system to virals like the, the SARS-CoV virus and, and may be incorporated within the diet of some form or another. So I just want to leave you that sort of uh, statement to digest and think about and I will finally conclude by uh, referring to the references that were used in this talk but also I would like to acknowledge uh, again Dr. Marisol Daboit who obviously is the lead uh, on this project. Um, uh, Joseph Fester who's in our PhD student who did most of the work. I also like to acknowledge Dr. Amir Hussein, 
who is a postdoc and is helping out uh, Joseph Bester in his work. And most importantly, uh, Iprona, who has provided us with the uh, elderberry extracts and also helped us um, with um, uh, providing some funds to do some work uh, with that. Thank you for listening. So hopefully, uh, right, we're back, sorry. Uh, hopefully I've given you a, a flavor of what's been happening. So and now, without any further ado, I'd like to sort of pass you on to Dr. We have um, Father Helen Coulter, who's a, a reader within our school, and I will pass her to her to talk a bit about eating in the lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Harpreet. Hello, um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, we're going to be moving from biology to uh, behaviour in my talk. So um, I'm a reader in the Institute of Psychological Sciences. I'm just going to start my presentation, hopefully. Um, and I specialise in oh, lifespan eating behaviour. Um, and I'm going to talk about some research that we carried out um, during the first lockdown on the 23rd of March, well, just after the 23rd of March, when the advice was um, quite a bit more consistent than it is now, um, and everyone was asked to kind of um, stay at home, um, save lives, protect the NHS. Um, so, yes, um, and this is research I'd like to kind of acknowledge my collaborators as well. Um, I carried out this research with Maxine Sharps and Louise Cunliffe, who are both from De Montfort, and also Annamika Van Dental uh, from University of Lincoln. Um, and really kind of the, the reason why uh, we decided to carry out this research, Annamika and I were doing some um, research on emotional eating in the lab. Um, and we knew that overeating in response to um, negative emotions, um, such as stress and sadness, um, are kind of a very well described concept in both children and adults. Um, it's associated with overweight and obesity. Um, and we really thought that actually the kind of the environment of the lockdown where people were kind of in their homes, um, in the their home environment near the kitchen, um, where there was some element of uh, food insecurity as well, um, might lead to people eating in these more kind of maladaptive ways. Um, there's very little research so far on eating in pandemics, um, although there's quite a bit of research starting to be published now, very interestingly. Um, but we know that um, research about natural disasters, such as hurricanes and earthquakes, um, we see a lot of kind of uh, food insecurity and food safety concerns, um, but also kind of changes in um, eating um, to uh, regulate emotion. Um, so there's one piece of research by Kudra and Boyce in 2012, um, and they actually found that um, increases in emotional eating um, after an earthquake in New Zealand um, was really only greater in people who are experiencing a lot of emotional distress around the event. So we decided to look at um, changes to food intake and emotional eating in a sample of adults in the UK. Um, and we particularly wanted to look at things like um, anxiety around COVID, health anxiety, um, food insecurity um, in this sample. Okay. So um, we recruited originally a thousand participants uh, from social media sites like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, De Montfort was very good at helping us try to recruit people. Um, as is the case with a lot of these studies, um, only 620 um, participants provided complete data. I think it's because we were asking people to self-report their BMI, which is quite often a problem. Um, and we found um, that the majority of our sample, unfortunately, uh, was female. Um, it, it was quite a nice age span from about 18 to 77 years with a mean age of about 40 years. I mean, it was a slightly overweight sample. So the cutoff uh, for overweight BMI is 25. So our sample was nearly 27 kilograms over meters squared. And we collected, um, they filled in surveys uh, 
between the 22nd of April and May. So that's weeks four to eight of the lockdown. Um, and we got people to fill in measures of their emotional eating, um, both prior to lockdown, so they self-reported that, and then during lockdown, and also their self uh, their perceived kind of changes to food intake. And we looked at nine different food groups, but today I'm going to talk about high energy density snacks, um, such as cakes, biscuits, crisps, those kind of things that are associated with overweight, um, fruit and vegetable consumption, which is associated with obviously more kind of adaptive, healthy eating styles, um, and also um, consumption of home prepared foods. This is home baked foods and also kind of homemade meals. Um, and we looked at quite a lot of different um, demographic variables because it obviously was kind of such an interesting time. So we looked at sex, age, ethnicity, whether people were vulnerable and isolating in the house, how they were shopping, their employment status, whether there were other people um, in their home. We measured food insecurity with the food insecurity scale, but we changed the questions to um, whether they've been food insecure since the lockdown on the 23rd of March. Um, we also looked at coping strategies uh, using the brief cope, and we factored these into adaptive and maladaptive coping strategies. So an example of an adaptive coping strategy would be uh, positively reframing a, an event or planning or using self-distraction. Um, an example of a maladaptive coping strategy would be something like a uh, low acceptance or denial of the situation or self-blame. And then we also look at health anxiety um, using the short health anxiety inventory. And we looked at general health anxiety and we also looked specifically at health anxiety in relation to the COVID virus. Um, OK, so what did we find? I'm going to. First, briefly uh, describe changes in food intake uh, represented by these three pie charts. Um, so we found increases um, in high energy density snack consumption. Um, and the increase in consumption is denoted by the black on these pie charts. So you can see for both high energy density snack foods and home prepared foods, um, we could see people were reporting that they were increasing um, eating more of these foods. Uh, not surprising because a lot of people are isolated in the home, so they're more likely to be eating home prepared foods and takeaways. Um, we saw a kind of lesser effect with fruit and vegetable consumption. So a lot of people are just eating the same amount of fruit and vegetables that they normally ate. Um, and we found that increases in eating high energy density snacks during lockdown was associated with being female, having a higher BMI, having children at home, probably pestering you to buy snack foods, and having a higher baseline of uncontrolled or emotional eating, um, having higher anxiety about catching COVID, and also having those higher maladaptive coping strategies. There were far less um, associations with uh, changes or increases in consumption of fruit and vegetables and home prepared foods. Um, and the main one was, these seem to be associated with adaptive coping styles. So if people were adopting adaptive coping styles, they were also eating more home prepared foods, um, eating more fruits and vegetables. So those kind of more positive eating behaviours that we want to encourage people to do. Um, and when we looked at emotional eating behaviour, um, we found actually as a whole, in the sample as a whole, um, Emotional eating behaviour did not increase uh, from how people reported their behaviour to normally be compared to lockdown, um, which we were kind of slightly surprised about. But it seemed that some people were increasing their emotional eating, whereas other people were actually doing less emotional eating than usual. And those people who um, reported increases in their emotional eating, they were much more likely to be isolating in the house, so kind of vulnerable. So you can already imagine the stakes are a bit higher about catching COVID. Um, they were more likely to be female. They're more likely to be food insecure. So you've got this kind of strange relationship between insecurity, but also overeating. Um, they were more likely to have a higher BMI they're more likely to have higher uncontrolled and emotional eating behaviours and also more likely to have these kind of maladaptive 
coping strategies. Um, and because um, we found kind of associations between emotional eating, BMI and maladaptive coping, um, we looked to see if the, there was like a moderation effect. And we found that actually um, for individuals with um, high maladaptive coping, which is the mid grey line on the top of this chart, um, who also had a higher BMI, so these are the individuals on the right of the chart, um, these individuals these people were much more likely to be um, reporting that they were um, emotionally eating more during lockdown. And this was after controlling for their baseline emotional eating levels. You can see there seems that there are some people at risk of kind of emotional eating and kind of problematic eating behaviours um, in these situations. Um, so just to finish, um, it seems that um, changes to eating behaviour, whether they be positive or negative changes, um, seem to be associated with a wider style of maladaptive or adaptive coping. Um, so increases in unhealthy eating is higher in those with um, a history of problematic eating and a high BMI. So there seems to be some people who are more at risk um, of kind of problematic eating in this kind of very strange uh, food environment that we found ourselves in. Um, um, what does this really mean? Can can we get people to adopt different coping strategies in future lockdowns? Can we make people more literate um, about how they cope in these kind of difficult situations so they can recognise um, when they might be at risk for kind of overeating? So thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. OK. Um, I would just like to um, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, at the end. So the next um, speaker is Dr. Hilary Shaw. Um, he's a visiting fellow from the Leicester Castle Business School, um, and he's going to be talking about COVID, obesity and poverty. So over to you, Hilary. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Hilary Shaw from you know, Leicester Castle Business School, Centre for Urban Research on Austerity. Going to look at two major, three major factors in society today. That's COVID, obesity and poverty. And these all, each one of these three is reinforcing and reinforced by the other two. So we've got what I would call a vicious triangle. And at the end, I'm going to see how we could possibly break into this triangle and, uh, and sort of aim for a better diet and a healthier society. So I'm just going to upload the uh, PowerPoint now and hopefully this will um, slide show from the beginning. So hopefully, hopefully you can all see my slides now. So this is our vicious triangle, um, big poverty and obesity. And so they all in fact reinforce and are reinforced by each other. So what can we actually do about this? Well, first of all, looking at the interaction between poverty, how it feeds into COVID. Uh, COVID causes COVID causing poverty. Well, most pandemic increase equality because wealth and production are hit. But the problem with COVID is that it's well, it's different because we avoid contact like in most pandemics. But a key point is we have online alternatives. So what's happening is that the large companies, Tesco and so on, and especially Jeff Bezos, Amazon, you might have seen that. Uh, his assets have actually increased a lot because of all the use of online uh, ordering. So we're seeing an increase in inequality where the large companies are carrying on sort of pretty much as normal. But the paid sectors that we're avoiding, those generic skills, these low paid work in these skills in hospitality, retail, uh, sectors like that. These, these are generic skill jobs they are often low paid. So we're seeing the low paid being hit hardest and uh, and essentially, this is likely to increase poverty and inequality. There are also long run COVID on education, which I'll get onto one arrow five, looking at COVID and obesity. So equally, poverty is causing COVID. And this brings in some research on in Leicester, Stoke-on-Trent, uh, Birmingham and South Wales, where some of the factors that cause increased COVID are things like crowded, overcrowded households, multi-generational households where younger people are infecting older people, poor health, comorbidities are very bad for worse version of COVID, use of public transport where you're more exposed to, to the virus perhaps, Un COVID unsafe workplaces, food processing where there's a lot of cold, hard, wet surfaces, 
coronavirus can linger. Health sector, of course, you're more exposed. Um, pollution increases susceptibility. So, um, so, so essentially, a lot of these factors are linked with poverty. They're also linked with BAME uh, being BAME because a lot of BAME people are less well off, and they also live in have suffer from these factors of overcrowded households, poor health lack of access to a private car and so on. So it looks like much of the BAME linkage that appears with COVID may be linked to, in fact, poverty factors. So moving on to the obesity causes, po poverty causes obesity. The key uh, factor here is the health premium. A healthy diet costs more than an unhealthy one, about 80% more to eat healthily in the UK. And this gap is growing wider over time and is worse in less affluent areas. So again, it's a force for it, it hits the poorest most. Street markets are actually cheaper. Some interesting factor here from Birmingham, that if you drill down into the data, you find that normally unemployment um, worsens the risk of obesity. Areas with higher unemployment have higher obesity. But in poorer areas, it's the opposite. You actually have more unemployment, is less obesity. And this could be because if you're working in a poor area, you can't access the cheap street markets. And uh, also, you're going to be exhausted after a day's work on low salaries, obviously jobs are tiring, poor people doing more than one job to make ends meet. And finally, the poor have less access to private transport, so less disposable carrying capacity. It's a bit like disposable income capacity. You've got to carry certain heavy things back, milk and toilet rolls and so on. And then you're not going to carry like low calorie, high bulky items like broccoli and cauliflower. You're going to carry back sort of dis uh, high dense energy foods. Uh, obesity causing poverty. Uh, well, again, the main fact here is that uh, diabetes type 2 and sleep apnea interrupted sleep from burden on the lungs. And the diabetes leads on to a cascade effect of other bad long health effects, cardiovascular problems, amputations, arthritis, blindness, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cancer. And of course, in terms of poverty, this is going to curb your employment and training. You can't be driving, you can't be operating heavy machinery if you've got sleep at the end of the day. Um, also, there's a prejudice against the obese at work and at school. It's been shown that obese people are less likely to be hired, less likely to be promoted. At school, we have some bad effects there because kids can get bullied for being obese at school. And so the net effect of this is uh, less, less promotion for obese adults, lower qualifications from school. So we have a problem of obesity, obesity feeding poverty there. And equally, uh, moving on to COVID, causing, COVID actually causing obesity in the long run because we've seen major job losses and seen this hits the poor the most, uh, feeding into unemployment, especially for the poor. There's less money for food. Uh, we've actually seen families having to choose between eating and uh, eating and heating or eating and rent. And in the long run, education is curbed. This is particularly bad because there's been a long shutdown, shutdown period. Private schools have been better at providing online teaching, but uh, more, more than state schools. And also, um, also, of course, there's been less access to IT. The uh, poorer people have less access to computers, less access to the Internet. Uh, yeah, poorer people have actually been forced to choose between food and data, quite literally food and data for their children. And there's less access to acquired study space because of overcrowded households in poorer areas. Uh, access to a study space is very important. And finally, we've, we've really bad, this is that some pupils have actually been taken out from school to work and help with fam family finances. And this is happening in the global south, places like India, but also in deprived rural USA, for instance, this has happened. And this might be short term family finances, but um, it's going to be very bad in the long run. You know, there's going to be a terrible hit on education. We're going to have the whole generation with lower earnings. And obesity causing COVID. Well, briefly, we'll be familiar with this. The main effect here is the excess weight on the lungs. And of course, COVID being uh, largely a respiratory disease, that's not going to help with your COVID experience. Less access to out of doors as well. Again, a poverty factor here. Um, that uh, if you're overweight or you're poor, you're going to, uh, you might be suffering from lack of vitamin D, which has been implicated in worse COVID. Also, less access to out of doors. Poorer people tend to live in uh, less walkable areas, less green leafy areas. And then if you live in a sort of busy traffic polluted area, there's less incentive to go out. And also the comorbidities from obesity, which also uh, doesn't help with your, that's been a risk factor as well. So how do we break in? Just to conclude, how do we break into this vicious triangle? 
Well, COVID is difficult, it seems to be here for the moment. There's no vaccine, hopefully we'll have one soon, but not as yet. Obesity, that's a very difficult thing to change in the long run. How do we, you can't change obesity because we've got, our bodies are built to hoard food. They're very efficient in terms of fat, famine never comes. But we can do something about poverty. So I'll conclude with some possible sort of manifesto, if you like, what could we do about poverty in the short run? Low pay is a major problem and we could definitely tackle that. We could, you know, minimum wage, do we need a universal basic income, which would be expensive, but could we have a national maximum wage to pay for that? Uh, so we could, we could tackle low pay. Poor accommodation, now seeing cramped accommodation, overloaded as a risk factor for COVID. Damp accommodation as well, poor quality. We've got a terrible housing market. We need to, we need to sort of fix our broken housing market so that people can afford decent accommodation. Uh, and obviously, just bring in a finding from Wales here that uh, people of Wales Valley, some of them have to pay four pounds return bus fare to access vital services, supermarkets, the benefits office, their job, uh, medical, the GP, they pay four pounds each time. And that's a huge amount when you're on a low income. It also tempts people to buy cheap cars. It's not good for the environment. So maybe reverse the bus privatisation that Mrs Thatcher did in 1986, bring buses back under council control. In the longer run, improving food access, knowledge and affordability. We could, well, we ought a sugar tax and a health tax. Why don't we have negative VAT on healthier food, which would maybe help smaller shops stock it so that people could access it. And... Uh, Finally, this would bring back the payback in health benefits. Wouldn't be just wouldn't be just immediately now for COVID. We end up with a healthier society and and better able to resist future pandemics. Okay, so uh, I'll now hand over back to uh, back to um, Parves and the uh, and the chair. So let's get out of this and uh, I'll now hand back. I think if you look to Parves and the uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much for this um, excellent presentation and the presentations that we had uh, from, from Helen and from Harpreet. Uh, I think it really goes to show uh, the diversity of research that is going on at De Montfort University. It's really, really interdisciplinary research covering you know, poverty issues, covering issues of uh, food habits and dietary sort of disorders, as well as as well as actually looking into food as medicine. So the two initial presentations were on food as medicine, a presentation by myself, who just gave some examples of research we are doing, but also presenting a wider perspective regarding the adoption of food as medicine by important organizations such as the National Health Service, which is at the forefront of fighting COVID-19. And sadly, you know, one of the things that I feel and many people feel that is not being uh, adequately used is the concept of food as medicine. When people are at, uh, in the hospitals and doing more research on food as medicine, ha having more um, randomized uh, clinical trials and so on. Because at the end of the day, we really do know that the public do believe in food as a medicine. 80% of the public consider food as medicine. So we really have a, a role here as scientists, as uh, you know, policymakers, to engage the uh, public and engage in more research that really looks into whether these claims regarding certain foods are really, really true or not. So what we're gonna have now is a panel discussion. And uh, maybe I can start off by uh, asking uh, a question and uh, every one of the panel members, our speakers, all of us will be able to um, um, sort of like take part and ask questions and so on. So we have a we have few minutes of questions and I think, I would start off by asking a question mm -hmm. to Hillary. Uh, Hillary, uh, mm -hmm. your, your presentation was fascinating and it really, really covers an area perhaps that is not being uh, adequately discussed, the, the impact of poverty. And uh, we now live in the age of big data. And I was wondering, one of the fascinating points that you raised was negative VAT or uh, mm -hmm. for healthy foods and so on. And because we live in the age of big data, do you think it might be possible, you know, I mean, even the shops, they use all our data to what, what our shopping habits are, and then they target us with certain products and sales and discounts and so on. Isn't it possible that, uh, you know, with this sort of data available, and we know where poverty lies, we know, for example, if you live in Surrey, uh, in, 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 in London, you, you are expected to live up to the age of 85 approximately. 
But as if you are living in Glasgow or if you are living in Sunderland in the northeast of England, you probably die at 70. So I think there is enough data that provides us information about where poverty lies, which postcodes poverty lies in, uh, which groups of people are most affected. So is there a, not a possibility that the government can introduce a scheme with the shops and businesses so that if you have your ID and you put that into when you go in with your, uh, you know, with your uh, shopping, uh, you know, some sort of card and you go to a shop and they identify that you belong to that postcode and therefore you might perhaps uh, come from an area where there is a lot of poverty and then automatically there is a discount that is given to certain healthy foods so that healthy foods become more amenable to the poorer because I mean we do know what the healthy foods are olive oil uh, oily fish you know the uh, salmon cod all of these foods are extremely expensive and out of reach for a lot of people is there a way that big data could be used to uh, you know sort of help the target population who really need these types of food okay I think there's a couple of, couple of points that I'd like to raise first first of all the supermarkets pretend they want to sell us fresh fruit and they put all this at the front to get us in but they're actually, actually they've got a commercial interest in selling us more processed food and uh, so they have to be persuaded to take part in this scheme and the other thing is I'm thinking well the three points the second point is that a lot of poor people they haven't got ac easy access to the supermarket they make their own private transport they rely more on the corner shops the sort of little local shops and the nice today and the uh, and the sort of you no know, not uh, so the general little corner shops and, and where they can get to more easily. So I was thinking, and these shops don't tend to have access to the same big data that Tesco and Sainsbury's has. So I was thinking of something that would help the smaller shops. You go to a smaller shop and the fresh fruit and veg there are way over, you know, way over the price of the supermarket. People just can't afford them sometimes. So I was thinking of some fiscal thing that would apply rather than using big data. And also, I mean, you live in a poor postcode. Is everybody poor in that postcode? They probably are, but... but maybe have some fiscal thing that would alter the price balance between processed cheap sugary food that would help the corner shops um without obviously making it such a sort of negative good a cheap good that is thrown away but s some way of actually making the food tax neutral so if we tax the sugar but we give that back in terms of negative tax on healthy foods yeah okay. I the other thing just to add to that as well is that actually when people are very food insecure um, they quite often have trouble paying their electricity bills. So things mm -hmm. like cooking uh, become quite an expensive thing to do. Um, so there's so many different kind of things going on, I think, in food insecurity mm -hmm. that you have to think about, that you can't just give people the raw ingredients and think that they're going to be using their ovens all the time, or if even if they have a cooker sometimes. Um, no, I just, I just, I just, households. <laughs> I just add there's a lot, yeah, a lot of these arcane cooking programs that use terms like jus and uh, and sous vide and do we know what they mean? And they sort of they almost make well, we need much simpler recipes. Like one thing I would do, I didn't mention is is to have simple, cheap, easy recipes to do. Put them at places like job centres, at GPs, at community centres, and actually cut out all the sort of jargon and just have some cheap, uh, easy recipe that anyone can do. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, I think. People were cooking a lot more, though, generally, uh, in our study in the pandemic. But I think it's that some people were, are doing a lot more cooking because they're at home and they're bored and they're trying to think of something to do. So they actually enjoy cooking, whereas it seems that for s some other people that they they don't start cooking in these kind of situations. So, yeah, I think sensible advice on getting people to cook their own food. I think it's been an inequality thing is where people who were sort of let's say upper middle class have gone in more for home cooking they got more because they're working from home a lot of poorer yeah. people on the jobs you can't do from home they've actually relied more on takeaways they're, they're short of money there so this is yeah. why the nutritional gaps between health and and poor the poor have done worse the rich have done better no definitely uh, helen can i just pick up a point and maybe hillary if you can maybe uh, answer i just wondering what what impact was did you observe any when we were out of the lockdown you know in during the summer when when the fast food chains were opened restaurants made open was there any data collected in terms of what was the human sort of, sort of behavior of some of the participants that uh, in terms of yeah. how they responded to that so uh, yeah. opening up restaurants and food, food courts and stuff you know what i really wish i'd had a crystal ball when i'd done our study because it was just an anonymous online study so we couldn't follow people longitudinally 
because we thought, oh, it'll all be over by July, uh, <laughs> very naively. But now looking back on it, it would have been fantastic to kind of follow people all over time and things like Eat Out to Help Out, which is obviously fantastic for small businesses and it's been a lifeline to them. But I mean, people are eating a, out a lot because it was half price. And yeah, you think, how, how is that affecting people's health? So yeah, no, I think it's. I didn't like it, but I think it'd be really interesting to look at. I think there was a lot of gaming going on in the sense, again, in inequality. What you had with Help Out to Eat Out and the fast food opening was there were wealthy people and there was a lot of publicity going on about how, oh, if we can be really clever and go and order one course each and it counts as a meal and get the discount and, get a, and how we can replay the system to get the major discount. And it was more the sort of upper middles were doing this to sort of, who had the sort of organisation to get together, four people together, get one meal, that was one course as a meal and so on. Uh, meanwhile, I think as Helen mentioned, there's a lot of stress eating and poorer people who were more under stress were actually going more for the sort of sugary fat fast food, which is which is a stress relief. You know, if you eat something like a McDonald's burger, mm -hmm. it's full of sugar, fat and salt. It makes you feel great. Doesn't doesn't do much for your health. Yeah. But for a short lot, time. Makes you feel good for a short time. Yeah, and there was a lot of this rush back to the sort of these sort of unhealthy fast foods in the poor areas, but I haven't actually got any quantitative data on this a bit recent for that. But that I think again it was a factor of worsening food inequality. Yeah. Um one thing I'd like to discuss more as well is about food as medicine and how you think that it kind of should be uh, promoted. You're talking about the fact there needs to be more evidence based, but is it harm? It, is there any harm if people eat a lot of garlic? Uh, does it change their behaviour if they think that they're using food as medicine? Do they then go out and <laughs> take more risky behaviours because they think they're being protected by garlic? Or is there any research on how using these foods changes behaviour or is there not really research about that yet? Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, if you look at what's happening around the world, there is a lot of, um, you know, sort of types of food that are being promoted in different countries. So if you are in India, uh, they have a tradition of uh, Ayurvedic medicine, which is thousands and thousands of years old. And so in that, um, you know, I mentioned about uh, Piper beetle leaf, beetle quid, you know. So there are certain things that are unique to certain countries and they're promoting that as the, uh, you know, sort of food that people sh can consume to protect themselves. Um, so garlic is one of those, also in India and around the world, actually, garlic is being, you know, widely promoted. Uh, I think I think that uh, the question of research, I think there isn't enough research done yet to see if how the people's behavior change uh, with respect to, you know, uh, if they've taken a certain uh, food and if they feel more sort of, uh, you know, prepared to take risks and go out and do things which they otherwise won't do. I don't think research has been much research has been done on, uh, okay. in that area. But but what it is is you know if you look at what's happening in the in the media, you see that people are promoting certain products, and then uh, different media organizations are doing fact check, and then they are uh, publishing things either saying these are fake, there are no uh, real uh, evidence for them. For example, WHO I showed in my slides that they are also saying that okay, garlic is not a cure for COVID-19 is good for your health mm -hmm. and it may be might have anti antimicrobial properties but there is no evidence to show that it is good against COVID-19. So the thing is COVID-19 has come only recently and there hasn't been enough research done even with some of these well-known foods whether it is actually a, a good in countering COVID-19 or not. And I really, really believe that just as much honey and uh, you know uh, other things that become adopted by major organization in due course i think when research becomes like for example what harpreet presented about elderberries and the type of research we've been doing on uh, nigella sativa i think these are these are foods that may have potential against covid 19 but it does need you know sort of funding to carry out rigorous research including randomized yeah. clinical trials because they're costly so I think I think more and more effort should be made onto this, and I'm really really pleased that at least in the UK, uh, our NHS is uh, open-minded, I would say, broad-minded in being able to consider these traditional medicines as long as there is scientific evidence behind them, and that is why they've adopted honey 
as one of the things that they're telling the people to take if they have cough for COVID-19. Yeah, I think from the... Uh, sorry. sorry. So is, 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 is there an affordability issue with some of these uh, foods in uh, in some of these uh, global south countries where maybe the wealthy will afford them, but the poor won't, and you're worse on health inequalities that way? Absolutely. I think I think what it is is that we witnessed this situation uh, in the UK. You know, I was in I think Iceland uh, during that time when the you know pandemic started, and I noticed there were people buying huge amounts of products, uh, and then there was another there, there, there was someone behind me behind that person looking really, really frustrated because she probably wasn't able to get as much product. So there is, you know, you, you know, I mean, you know, there is poverty issues, you know, people can, you know, do this panic buying and stockpiling of foods, other cannot. And mm. also when you have scientific research showing, you know, suggesting or fake news, you know, scientific research has always now become very much uh, promoted through the media. So whenever someone shows a food, is active against a virus or a bacteria that makes the news. So, for example, the Anglo-Saxon 1,000-year-old uh, garlic and onion soup, because some researchers did some work at Nottingham University and Warwick University, and they showed that it was active against antibiotic-resistant bacteria. That made the media, the BBC, and other news. So the public thinks, my God, you know, this uh, you know garlic and onion, I have that in my kitchen. It's good enough to fight against the viruses and colds and so on. So I'll just use that. So what's happening is that people are not doing these things just because they, are, uh, they don't have any informal knowledge. This information actually comes from somewhere, either from traditional knowledge inherited from uh, you know, whatever culture they're living in or what researchers are doing nowadays and uh, publishing their work and promoting it, you know, whether it is elderberries or nigella sativa or garlic, there are huge number of newspaper reports which have said something good about them. So, so there is this issue. And what then happens is the price of things goes up. So what you said, Hillary, is absolutely right. You know, what happens is people mass, you know, the rich people will end up stockpiling all the garlic, all the elderberries. They're expensive, by the way. Blueberries and all these things are very expensive even now in the shops. So what happens is the rich people will buy them because they have seen scientific research being done saying that it's really, really good. And then what happens is those things that were normally accessible to the poor does not become accessible to them anymore. And I remember uh, at the Montford University where I'm working, I had a colleague who was actually, you know, the caretaker of the building. He was looking after the building, uh, Hawthorne building. And he was telling me when he was young in Leicester, it was easy to, it was very cheap to buy fish like cod and salmon from the uh, fish market. Now it is out of his reach. When he was young, it was possible. Now he could buy lots of chocolates and fast food very cheaply. Those days, it was expensive. So mm -hmm. what has happened is that scientific research and knowledge has helped, what you just rightly said, has helped to make those people who can afford the food mm -hmm. to buy them and in the process make things that were previously cheap become very expensive. So doing something about that to make uh, good food easily accessible to those who are real, who are in real need, the people in poverty, I think something needs to be done about this. I think at the moment there is nothing much being done about making uh, food cheaper, cheaper for those people who want a healthy diet and nutrition. But we have a lot of food waste as well, so mm. there are opportunities, um, I think, that aren't being exploited always for just distribution reasons quite often, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. one thing I was going to ask you, I know there's a question actually, but um, one, one thing I was going to ask you as well, that say from the cancer literature, what we find um, is that if people start using some natural remedies, they'll use them instead of their treatment because they think if they go vegan, for example, that they don't need to have chemotherapy. We get these kind of um, slightly problematic beliefs sometimes that I think um, I, I've encountered in the cancer literature anyway. So yeah, I think that's the key point. I think with, the, with all these natural products and medicine, the concentration or the amount you need to have some beneficial effect is huge. Again, if I was going to have the beneficial effect of having elderberries, I need to be consuming loads and loads of it before it can have an effect so hence that's why we're, you know the way the medicine is probably going is maybe looking at a compound within that particular plant or substance can be very yeah. concentrated and maybe use a supplement of some sort but again it's expensive stuff extracting that from a plant and using that as a drug um but yeah but i think you've yeah, got a couple of questions on the yeah uh, which probably needs addressing yes. 
Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I think there are uh, two questions from Faye. And uh, one of them uh, asks, do you think that for areas with more poverty and lower income, like you were saying earlier, mm -hmm. and how they have less access to healthy foods and rely on corner shops, should have higher focus on having links straight to the farmers or farmers markets where there are more opportunities in giving food to rural areas without access. Do you think the government offer aid in this and what aid could they offer? And I think this is the question I think Hillary uh, would be best placed to answer because he's, 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 he's done a lot of interesting research in this area, I guess. Yeah, this is a problem with food deserts. There's a, there's a thing, if you look it up, food deserts, there, there are different sorts here. Um, now, what we're looking at here, one thing is rural areas. And the problem with food deserts, it's like three-dimensional. You've got a problem of access, which is rural areas, miles to the shops. Uh, a lot of rural areas simply don't have a shop physically close to them. You've got affordability, which is a big one here, where that would be more in the inner city, well, sort of yeah, inner city. And our, and our edge of town, sort of what were formerly local authority housing estates, huge areas of housing poorly supplied by supermarkets. You've just got the corner shops and there's some way from the countryside. And then you've got the knowledge issue of foods. You've got um, affordability, um, access and not food knowledge. Now, the thing with karma shops is they tend to be quite sort of, let's say, elitist. They tend to be quite upmarket. And yes, that would be great if rural areas, I mean, rural areas, the, the, the farmer's shop does stand in as the grocery shop. But and yes, it would be great to get more of those in the countryside and give access to villages that haven't got retailing. So you've got an access problem. I'm not sure you would arrange unless the farm shops, well, they're not going to deliver because they haven't got the infrastructure to these sort of, let's say, these poor edge of town uh, local authority estates. I think you've really got to look at the existing infrastructure, which is the sort of nice todays and lifestyle expresses and the corner shops. And yeah, maybe they could link with the farm shop, but uh, there might be some way from one. But uh, it would be it would be great to have rural produce put into these shops. I'll just say, just to conclude, the thing is that the shops aren't going to link up with the farm shops. The corner shops on the estates aren't going to link up with the farm shops unless they know they can sell it because far corner shops don't want waste. They can't afford it. So I think you've got to somehow raise up demand first before you can expect the shops to stock it. So you've got to sort of tackle the psychology and the knowledge of food and the recipes. And then then you'll see the corner shops starting to link up with the fresh produce, I think. Uh, I was going to add something to this uh, interesting point that Faye raised. And that is, I think, you know, more than ever before, I think the public are aware about food insecurity. You know, when people went to shops and they could not find the foods that they wanted. And, you know, why were they panic buying? People are panic buying because uh, the, of the fact that they realize that they don't have a garden or they don't have a piece of land or plot where they're growing their own food. So that we are completely dependent on shops. And I think that became very clear. And the other thing that I think also uh, became very clear is that we, we are panic buying because we realize that we are all on our own. You know, perhaps, you know, we don't have a community anymore. Like we used to have a community. When you used to have a community, mm -hmm. people used to share and care more. And so there was, insecurity was less. So if someone had, uh, you know, cereal, someone might have milk and they would share amongst each other during the time of need and famine and so on. But because now we live individual lives and we are all separated from one another and community feeling is much less. People are so afraid that what's going to happen if I can't go to the shops and, you know, all the food is taken. So I have to panic buy. I have to stockpile and so on. So I think more needs to be done to recreate communities once more so that, for example, in the local areas, in the councils could actually create a space where people can grow essential foods. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. take part, work with the farmers to do some uh, growing of crops and foods and other things. Re-engage with nature. This will also be good for mental health, physical activity, and also make the people and the children especially realize how food comes into our table, not from online delivery men, mm -hmm. but actually it is grown on uh, in a field. And also appreciate the hard work that goes in producing food. Because one of the things that David Attenborough was asked, what mm -hmm. would he, what was his best advice? What is the best advice you can give to the to the world to the you know the young people and everyone else and the thing he said was do not waste and and the thing is uh, the reason you waste is because we don't understand how where food comes from the hard work that goes in producing food and so on and so you know the, and also helen raised about the issue of waste there is so much food wasted and we don't really uh, you know care about this as much as we should so really i think i think a more of an integrated thinking about food 
it's timely, especially with this COVID-19, we realize how insecure you are. And I really, really believe, I really, really would like to see the government and the local governments creating spaces where the people can grow apples, people, the fruits of the season, for example, can be grown and the public can actually gain access from the, so, you know, even a, even five or six apple from Sainsbury's or Tesco's cost, cost you one pound 60, two pound, two pound 50. And, you know, I say the old saying, an apple a day, it's the doctors away. And I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, you know, wisdom behind this, but, you know, some people can't buy, can't buy enough apples because it's expensive. So, okay. you know, they cannot have an apple a day. I just think there were a couple of things about not, not so saying very, very, very briefly, we used, I mean, we used to have local authority housing with large gardens for vegetable plots. And we're kind of trying to get back to this almost like dig for victory where community gardens and urban farms. And that, that's great. In camp, you know, that's being tried in, in poor urban areas. Can we do that? And uh, the problem is, well, there's problems like the security, vandalism. And uh, this is before COVID. And the problem, I think, with just say briefly with COVID is that it, we're seeing an unraveling because we're avoiding each other of some community, you know, community meeting places, pubs, clubs are shutting, football grounds are being played without order. I think the problem with COVID, what you said, yeah, we do need more community. And this is something we really need to look at with COVID because COVID is unraveling our community meeting places. And it's almost like going backwards in that respect. We need to really revitalize yeah, our local communities and links. Absolutely, I agree with this. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Helen, do you have something to add to this? Um, well, I mean, it's. It, I think the thing is with the pandemic as well. I mean, a lot of those food insecurity problems are problems that were happening that we're discussing were happening before the pandemic, um, and then obviously when the lockdown happened on the twenty third of twenty third of March, I forgot what day it was. Um, then obviously um, we kind of shifted into a different food environment and for those people um, who were very food insecure um, it obviously compounded the problem there were you couldn't get online deliveries um, there were people who were very very vulnerable who couldn't go into supermarkets um, and they were particularly people with certain health problems um, so there were some people who kind of really really suffered uh, in terms of food insecurity during the first bit of the pandemic, who weren't necessarily the people who were food insecure beforehand, um, and then kind of linked with this anxiety that was going on about the virus. What I've read as well about um, how people adapt to pandemics in terms of stress um, and coping is that you quite often have this initial part when uh, people find out about the pandemic they're very frightened uh, they have very uh, kind of inconsistent coping strategies they think that you know they're very very at risk and then as you go through that there's kind of a process of people adapting and almost we're getting to a stage now where people are probably adapting too well and they're going out and uh, if you go um, I live in Birmingham if you go in there uh, into town at the weekend there's a lot of people not socially distancing so we've almost kind of adapted too well to the environment now so you tend to get this kind of process of um change uh, but i think particularly at the beginning of the pandemic and lockdown there were really kind of unusual food insecurity issues whereas i think now the main insecurity problems are to do with people losing their employment worrying about losing their housing all those kind of things that are the financial uh, fallout of the pandemic um, are kind of more relevant to the things we've been discussing, I think, about food insecurity. Um, so, yeah, I, I think sometimes things like this are moments that illustrate some of the problems in society. I don't know if you guys agree, but um, Sometimes, you know, we kind of feel very comfortable in our environment and things are just kind of traveling along. And then when something like this happens, you think you do start thinking about how bad it, food insecurity is um, when you start experiencing it yourself. So, yeah, that's what I think. It's kind of like a teachable moment in a way. Um, I think this point, valid point, I think everyone's made as well. I think we know that the, the pandemic's hit, the COVID uh, sort of crisis is here to stay. And obviously, where a lot of um, money for the government, for research councils, have been investing in sort of vaccination and how to treat, but going forward, 
you know, this the, the virus is here now, and we have to sort mm -hmm. of alongside this. And it's just about again going back to educating the less privileged um, community about healthy well-being, healthy eating, and healthy sort of uh, mental health, which will help them to cope through this sort of um, uh, pandemic we're going through. Going through. So I think some investment in terms of like private assembly, local authorities um, need to maybe work quite close with with the communities in terms of promoting that uh, uh, and seeing how cost less cost effectively that can be used. We're not. We're not asking them to you you know go about by elderly, but just having a healthy, balanced diet um, mm. and that well-being will help to boost their immune system, help them cope yeah. with this pandemic. I think that's a key that message that needs to be sort of sent across uh, throughout the communities. Yeah, I think there's a problem where we Helen mentioned waste, and there's a problem with waste is that people don't understand food let's say call it food biology food hygiene and also sell by and use by dates and i've seen people think you get some that uh, i mean used by dates is yeah food that goes off sell by is more of a stock taking thing and people will see something like yogurt that doesn't go off oh it's sell by a week ago or you know, even two days ago well it's not it's still perfectly safe to eat they look at bread and they think oh it's 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 went out yesterday i'll die if i eat this bread no you won't you know check if it's come on you know even like cheese you can sort of you can if it's got mold on one end yes you should cut that off but you can still doesn't mean the whole thing is bad there's a lot of um there's a lot of waste that's unnecessary because people don't understand things about food and keeping old food and old dishes you know people don't eat all the food they think they've got to throw it out you can make perfectly good uh, dishes with old pasta from yesterday and do something else with it that's even nicer yeah well i think people disgusted actually about things like that and it's interesting why people I think we live in such a food environment where everything has to be perfect all the apples have to be beautiful no blemishes no bruises and people and a lot of packaged food and people get very used to their food being in a perfect condition and if there's any slight problem or issue on that food or blemish they're like that's dangerous that's bad for me or, I'll chuck that in the bin so there is there's a kind of the that kind of very artificial food environment that we live in i think has really affected how people kind of use their leftovers and things like that and also we live in such a abundant food environment for a lot of people obviously not for all people um that people don't think that much about throwing food away so mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, uh, we had some nice and interesting discussions and uh, raised some interesting points for future, you know, sort of uh, future research and also for the authorities to really look into. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. But before that, I was just going to say that uh, one of the things that makes us human beings is uh, being social. And I think this, all of this lockdown and all of the things that is happening around us is uh, making us more and more adapted. I guess some people will soon after one year becoming adapted to living on their own or being alone. And this, this social element of human beings interacting with each other, I think is well known to be healthy, well known to boost the immune system and so on. So I think there is a danger that we will might become more antisocial. And I think therefore, my point that I was saying about the community, the local councils and so on, can recreate community environment where people can uh, share and care for each other, grow fruits and vegetables, and make more interactions between people, so that we can, you know, uh, you know, cope with these types of uh, pandemics and other situations that may emerge in the future. So we should prepare for the future. I think. COVID-19 should give us lessons that we should say, what are the good points, what are the bad points, and how can you move to the future? Because at the end of the day, we've seen from this pandemic that the human beings are very nice, very kind. People have helped each other. People have visited the elderly living in the neighborhood and gone to support them. But we've also seen the ugly side. When people who can afford it, they would buy everything uh, in a shelf and leave nothing for others to buy. So we've seen the good side and bad side of human nature. And I think, mm -hmm. Uh, if we continue to have this, uh, you know, sort of virtual life, everything delivered and there is no human interaction, we break down our community, then I think uh, we are going to have a very, very sad uh, future. And I think this is where I think we really need to put more effort into rebuilding our communities like what we used to have and which worked very well in the past. Uh, I think there is a question uh, from uh, from Adam Wilson, which uh, uh, is... Uh, which I think might be useful to uh, just have a comment on. 
And I think Hillary might be the person best. I, no, James Thompson, actually. He said that I had not considered the cost of electricity for cooking to eat healthy food. So this is the cost of electricity, Hillary. Do you, do you want to comment on something? Yeah. This would be our yeah. final, uh, final question. Yeah, this brings up the cost of, uh, and I think they mentioned with the other people, Helen and so on here, that there's been a lot of um, cost of, it's other, it's other things here, they're famous, I think, fuel poverty and uh, transport poverty. And I think as Alan said, that people, if, if, you, if you can't pay the rent or you can't pay the electric bill, you're going to see that as more priority than the food, really, because you don't want to get evicted. And you think, well, I can skip a meal or I can do some really cheap takeaway. At least I'm not going to lose my home and not going to cut off. The cutting off is more of a priority. So for the very poorest, the poorest five or ten percent of society it, it is a problem fuel, fuel poverty is a major problem this is winter coming up as well there are old people some poorer pensioners not all pensioners are wealthy and we need to think about uh, it's more of a general poverty question that can we sort of i suppose it comes back to can we improve pay rates uh, national like a universal basic income maybe up make sure that we have a livable wage not just the minimum wage so really everybody and and, tra and accommodation costs need to be tackled and this is all the background to making food affordable if everything else is affordable then food should be more affordable yeah. as well but universal credit is locked isn't it so i don't think mm. this problem is going to be solved maybe quickly <laughs> at the moment mm. um so yeah uh Hapid, do you have any comments last final comment to make before you close no, I, think it is. I think it was just uh, some just what can knowledge that's been good excellence and discussion and i can see on the comic box as well uh, i think adam wilson and several of us have made some They've, they've highlighted some interesting discussions that took place today yes. and i just want to again uh, just thank the organizers and, and, and to be involved with this panel and i think it was good to hear from all of you uh, and i think um, yes again yeah i think my only message is to maybe think about you know this is this the healthy well-being aspects so of healthy you know, the healthy diet and how we can possibly implement that across our community Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for the speakers who've taken part and given their time in presenting their work. Also to all those who've taken part, although we cannot see you, uh, we thank you for engaging on this World uh, Food Day event. And I think, finally, I'd like to say food is such an important thing for us. And I think COVID-19 has highlighted this. So let us do things uh, to improve our society for the benefit of humanity. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.